Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Eve Geography and Geopolitics. I am Alexei of Card. Thank you once again for joining me with this series. This is the third episode. It's been quite a while since the last update, and so much has changed. Now, normally, we would say that Eve has not had significant geographical changes. Certainly, CCP hasn't added any new systems to the game since my last video. However, we are going to open up this video with what I would consider a fairly substantial geographical change, although, you know, it's a bit of a personal one. I want to bring to you guys Providence. Now, this is the Dotland map, for those of you not familiar with it. It is a more abstract version of the star map that makes things easier to read. In terms of the actual EVE map, we're bringing it all the way down here to this little region right here. Providence is one of the most famous regions in EVE, uh, home to some of the original alliances. Curatoris Veritatis Alliance has held the space for the vast majority of the region's existence. They're an Amar role-playing alliance, or at least they were. I think they still consider themselves that. And they kind of run the show down there, along with a few other alliances, including Apocalypse Now, Severance, other alliances that have come and gone over the years. They call them the residents. Now, CVA has had a pretty tight grip on Providence. It's left their hands a few times over the years. However, they have been enjoying a fairly solid run of dominance for a little while now. The geographical change is centered on this system in 9UI. 9UI, as you can see, has many offshoots, making it an excellent travel system. You'll also notice it has three ingest points from low sec and high sec. Asa is a low sec entrance. Pari and Detal are both high sec entrances relatively close to the Amar trade hub, making these routes very popular. Providence's unique geography to cover a little bit more in the first video, I'll just go over it briefly here. It's got these NPCing pockets off shooting. It's got these clustered systems here, 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 and here. And then, of course, you got a few more NPCing clusters down here and here. This very amply sized one over here, and this tiny one over here. Uh, you'll also see it kind of has a slightly cyclical structure. You've got this kind of loop that goes like that. But you can also skip through catch and get into the 9UI area. 9UI area itself has a bit of a loop which you can pass in the, right in the middle of through the DPUH corridor. This unique geography makes it a heck of a lot of fun to roam around in. You're likely to get tons of targets. And CVA has become very good at chasing people out of their space over the years. So that dynamic of a lot of tempting targets and a very high-stakes chase as the defensive fleets try to run you out of their systems, it's created a, a pretty enjoyable environment for small gang PvP, and it's become one of the hotbeds of PvP over the years. The big news, the big change, is that 9UI, which has been controlled by CVA for the vast majority of its existence, has finally been returned to its ultimate roots, where the station that existed in 9UI was originally a free port. That means that anyone could dock there. Now, it is also a free port. Now, maybe we don't have one station per system like we used to. The Citadel patch saw to that, which we talked about a few shows ago. Uh, there are now multiple stations in 9UI, including a Keepstar, the largest possible player-built station that's not faction. However, there is also now a Fortizar put down there that will enable subcaps and caps to dock at it. It's equipped with a market, which means you can live out of it if you'd like to. Or you could just buy something as you're stopping by. Perhaps you plan on day tripping to this storied region on EVE, which again, I would highly recommend. You can now do that. By having this Fortizar here, it creates kind of a safe haven where normally these fleets would be very intent on chasing you out and camping you. Now they really no longer can because you can dock safely in 9UI as a visitor to the region or as an active PvP -er in the region. And I'm very happy to report that yours truly is behind this. Uh, we launched what we're calling the Providence Black Market in 9UI, a dockable market Fortizar for the EVE community to use, particularly those that get their content from and around Providence. Go check it out. 
Uh, this kind of, in my view, opens up a lot of this region to even more PvP activity than it usually had. And I'm very excited to see what the EVE community does with it. Hopefully by the time you're watching this video, it's still alive. Uh, it remains to be seen because we did not put it up with CVA's permission. And, uh, you know, they, they may or may not like that. I will keep you guys updated as that progresses. While we're in the Providence area, let's talk about a few other changes that have gone down. Particularly, I want to draw your attention to this constellation right here. Now, this constellation is not what you would consider traditional Pravi holder alliances, the resident alliances. This is Honorable Third Party and some of their allies. Now, Honorable Third Party is a traditional Providence antagonist, often uh, active in the low sec, bordering Providence, hot dropping fleets, uh, occasionally poking at structures, that kind of thing. Never have taken actual space until recently. There was an invasion by Pandemic Legion into the Providence region. Pandemic Legion didn't really take tons of space, but what they did do was destroy a lot of stations and generally weaken and wear down Pravi's defenses and willpower. This enabled HTP to kind of slip in there, take some space. Uh, you also see Purple Helmet of Warriors up here. They've got some space. That's part of that group as well. And uh, they're quite the thorn in the side of Providence. And despite being well outnumbered by what we call Pravi Block, aka CVA and their allies, they have managed to tenaciously hold their ground and hold these systems and a lot of the stations within them. So they've got Astra Houses and um, Refinery Athenors and all kinds of stuff in here, able to defend against the odds against CVA. Pretty impressive. Let's transition to what's going on in the east. This is the uh, eastern part of EVE, also known as the Drone Lands. We talk about this in great detail in the first video. An expansion area. Very interesting in that it's very isolated. You'll notice these really long jump lines. That represents the gaps in space. So a lot of capital ships, for instance, can't really get directly to the drone lands. Sometimes they'll have to go through a gate. Sometimes they're passing through other regions, like Great Wildlands, for instance, or... Yeah, mostly Great Wildlands. <laughs> Uh, this tiny area up here, maybe you can hop to this tiny area over here, but it's quite tight. It's very isolated, very uh, easy to defend, but also kind of awkward to get to, and the traditional value of the space has not really been that high. So it's often been kind of just ignored by most of the game. What you'll commonly see are renting alliances in there, like Brothers of Tangra. You'll see the Russian alliances like Triple X Death, which used to control a large portion of this area, X Death and Solar. Very interestingly, uh, when we last touched on those alliances, they were engaged in a battle for survival with Triumvirate. One of the southern alliances uh, used to be right here. We'll get to that in a sec. And they were not doing too well, despite again having a massive numerical advantage. Tri was able to hold their ground for the most part, actually be able to fight a war on two fronts, and eventually win that war. They surrendered, which uh, didn't turn out to be that much of a surrender. Uh, they let X-Death and Solar win for a hot minute. Uh, X-Death and Solar, for whatever reason, declined to finish off Tri and actually left most of their space and most of their structures intact. So with Tri withdrew. Realized they weren't getting an attack anymore, came right back and filled in uh, filled in the hole and went right back on the offensive. And so they did pretty well. Now while all this was going on, the drone land Russians ceded a lot of territory, uh, particularly to Pandemic Horde. You'll see now it owns Geminit and now owns part of the Kalvala Expanse. This was a strategic decision by the drone land Russians to move their supply lines closer to the front in the south. They hoped by concentrating themselves into a smaller area, they would be able to more effectively fight that war. It wound up not working out too well. Um, while that transition was happening, Tri was able to close up the war on their southern front against FCON, Fidelis Constance, an alliance which is no longer with us as a direct result of the aftermath of that war. 
Uh, fraternity came in and basically filled the gap where FCON was, became allies with Tri, further strengthening their position, and they kind of put themselves into a bit of a bind. Uh, meanwhile, they had all this space up here still that was not as not very well defended. They were exhausted fighting against Tri, and in the midst of that, a new coalition called the Holy League, now known as the Holy Rental Empire because they've taken all this space, uh, came in and really established themselves. We're talking Skill Yourself, we're talking Volta, uh, several what were wormhole groups decided to come out into K-Space, a.k.a. Known Space, and really apply themselves to the Sav game in a way that wormhole alliances really hadn't before. And they've turned out to be extremely successful. These wormholers were hardened fighters due to the nature of being in wormhole space. They were really effective at fighting against the odds, fighting with high-skilled, very expensive doctrines, uh, and just were able to hit the Droneland Russians in a way they were not prepared for and really couldn't take at that point. This is an alliance, or coalition, excuse me, that had been fighting for many, many months, and for most of those months on the losing end, or at least in a very frustrating status quo. So they were just not ready for this, and it wound up being a bit of a wipe. There was really no effective defense mounted. And they just kept getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back and pushed back until finally they were down to less than a region. Try was still resurgent, and uh, they just had to basically call it. Now, X-Death still exists as a thing, but they are now down here in Tenerifus. And they are essentially crashing on the couch, trying to recharge their batteries after such a very intense period of fighting for a very long period of time for EVE fighting. And again, uh, intense fighting, going at it uh, with several big ops, uh, one key element that brought an end to the conflict very quickly, to rephrase, when this fight started, no one thought it would go on very long. They thought Tri would get crushed. Tri wound up lasting for a long, long time. When the Wormhole Alliances came out and started attacking, people thought that war wouldn't go anywhere at all. It wound up going very fast. When things finally came to a close, they came to a close very suddenly. There was a capital move op by the Droneland Russians where they were trying to relocate their strategic reserve of capital ships and super capital ships from one front to the other. In the midst of that move op, they were ambushed. They, they wound up losing a significant chunk of ships, uh, and it really kind of put the end to their ability to effectively defend or even have a pretense of defending. They just needed some time. So... They've relocated down here. Uh, they have not been attacked since, to my knowledge, at least not in a serious way, and are basically holding steady here as part owners of Tenerifus, recharging themselves, getting their uh, members back and recharge, getting their ISK wallets back and recharge. However, they have taken overall a pretty significant loss of prestige, a loss of members, a uh, loss of their coalition, which doesn't exist anymore. And so they're in a bit of a rebuilding phase. Try, on the other hand, was looking really good. Uh, they had an extremely strong relationship with Fraternity, but uh, ultimately could not win the peace. After this huge, what I would consider a pretty massive victory, and I think most people would as well, considering the odds they were up against, they established themselves here in Insmother, Scalding Pass, but, you know, after taking a little bit of time to recharge the batteries and isk up a little bit, some of their membership started to go AFK, including very key leaders. Now, once that happened, things were not looking too good. And we'll get into what happened with them exactly, but first we need to pivot very slightly to the upper left here in Great Wildlands. A couple key things have happened in Great Wildlands that bear mention and have a relationship to what goes on in the South a bit later. The big story, well, a few of them, one of them is that Templus Calcif, who some of you may know, or may not know, as one of the key mainstays of Kaldari faction warfare. Now, faction warfare space tends to be low-sec space in between empires. So up here you've got the uh, Galenti region of Placid, 
the Kaldari region of Lone Trek. Here in Black Rise, that's faction warfare territory. And that was the bread and butter of Templus Calcif. They were the core of the Kaldari militia. They made waves this past year by relocating themselves out of faction warfare entirely and moving from Black Rise into the NPC region of Great Wildland. Now, uh, that was a pretty big deal. It also sparked a few other changes in that people said, oh, maybe we should also move to Great Wildlands. You had Mercenary Coalition still on the map up here. They relocated down to Great Wildlands as well. But unfortunately, we're having quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of internal issues, and unfortunately, we have to report that Mercenary Coalition, including the corp that I had founded, Noir, has shut its doors, and Noir has also shut its doors very late last year in extremely tragic fashion but it is what it is there had been a lot of fighting in great wildlands that kind of attracted people to that area my group was involved quite a bit capitalist army now a member of the network alliance we were kind of engaged in a do or die struggle with some other great wildlands entities particularly ebola who had been traditional residents there and did not appreciate that uh, some of the new alliances coming in were not their friends. And decided, hey, let's take advantage of a power gap as one or two of these alliances decided to leave. And let's try to push everyone else out. So they had the means to do it and they tried it. A coalition formed against them called the Cure. Cure wound up fighting back. Cure eventually won. Great Wildlands was sort of settled down a bit, and now there was extra space for people to come in. Templus Calsa filled that void. Mercenary Coalition was to fill one of those voids, but wound up collapsing before they could. As all this is going on, a curse alliance named Scourge began to align itself with Skill Yourself of the Holy Rental Empire and began to make itself known as like a power in the area particularly in the region of Scalding Pass, which borders Great Wildlands. There was immediate fighting between some members of the Cure Coalition and Scourge. That hit pause really quickly because Scourge realized that Tri had a bit of a weakness. Again, those key members that went AFK, the general war weariness of the Triumvirate Alliance. Scourge saw their opportunity and with Skill Yourself support, managed to push in and take a large swath of space. <laughs> Once they did so, it was kind of a, a snowball down the hill. Uh, Tri was just not able to mount an effective defense, and members of the Cure Coalition were not strong enough to really fight Scourge and Skill Yourself at the same time. And so you'll see Scourge and Skill Yourself take what was essentially all of Tri's empire. And that eventually led to the at least partial collapse of Tri temporarily. Now, we will join Tri very shortly and follow them up to a different region of space. Right now, Scourge has kind of established themselves, and some of the alliances in Scalding Pass are still resisting. In particular, uh, you'll see Bright Side of Death, a Russian alliance that's opposed to Scourge. Also a curse resident, however, they've had Sav in Scalding Pass for quite a while. They have been at relatively good relations with this alliance fraternity. However, that relationship has soured recently, and fraternity has begun to kick them out. Scourge has been getting in on that fighting as well. Bright Side of Death is allied with a lot of the folks in the Cure Coalition, so Cure is now back in the fight. They are supporting them against fraternity. They're supporting them against Scourge. And the fighting looks like it's about to pick up. As I record this video, my alliance has just deployed there. So uh, we are going to be getting involved in some of the fighting that's going on down there. And uh, it's hard to say at, to what extent the map would shift. However, several Scourge systems are reinforced. Bright Side of Death has lost a few systems to Fraternity, but I think is counterattacking on them. Scourge, for their part, are trying to install renters in parts of Scalding Pass they don't currently own, which could establish them with some decent rental income, as well as put new alliances on the map. So this is a, a pretty uh, exciting area, in my view, and again, I'm a little bit biased because it is in our neighborhood, so to speak, uh, but there's a lot of interesting things happening here in this cursed Great Wildlands, Scalding Pass, Insmother, 
area, this, this little melting pot of small alliances that have been fighting each other at this point uh, for over six months at least. Uh, a pretty constant warfare down there. Uh, it's just a really interesting politically volatile area in contrast to some of the areas that we're going to cover. Speaking of which, uh, let us transition up to the north here. In the north, there have been a few major changes since the previous uh, geography and geopolitics video, but for the most part, things have been fairly solid. The biggest developments of note recently are that Tri, being evicted from the south, is attempting to establish themselves in the region of Pureblind. Uh, you'll see that they've taken portion of space. However, that tiny portion of space has been dearly paid for with a number of pretty severe losses in terms of battlefield loss. Uh, Tri's had a very rough time establishing itself up in the north, facing, you know, I'm sure stiffer resistance than they expected, as well as making a few tactical mistakes that I'm sure they wish they hadn't. Uh, there's also, of interest, the we touched about it here when talking about the drone lands, but Pandemic Horde has relocated. The whole reason Pure Blind is kind of up for grabs now. Pandemic Horde used to live over there, it used to be on the border between the Imperium, represented by the Initiative, and Pandam uh, excuse me, and Panfam and Guardians of the Galaxy. Panfam is Pandemic Legion, NC Dot, Pandemic Horde, and a few related alliances basically take up this chunk of the map. By having Horde relocate, they've consolidated their position quite well. Guardians of the Galaxy is the other coalition of the North. They're friendly with Panfam generally. However, we do need to talk about some souring of that relationship recently. Uh, Darkness is the key alliance there, and they've got Slice and a few others. This, down in here, Cloud Ring and Pureblind, is a mix of... Alliances that are friendly to the Imperium, alliances that are friendly to Guardians of the Galaxy, and alliances that don't really have any affiliation at all, and all sides are just kind of happy for them to be there in that border zone. For instance, the Velour Accords down here. That's actually a faction warfare alliance from, from Black Rise, affiliated with the Galente. They've taken some space. So this is a, also an interesting area that's kind of stabilized a little bit, but the process by which it stabilizes is extremely interesting. <laughs> One of the things that happened after Pandemic Horde relocated is that kind of threw the status quo of the North off a little bit. You had these new alliances come in and start trouble. You also had some alliances that were elsewhere decide to get the boot. It was an opportunity to shake things up. One of those alliances was Circle of Two, who had backstabbed Imperium in World War B not too long ago and had some issues with Legacy before that, or excuse me, after that, down in the south. Once they got kicked out of the south, they moved up here, back toward more or less where they used to be, but at that point, they weren't well trusted or that well liked. So, some people liked them. I would consider them a controversial alliance, to say the least. Uh, their alliance leader had gotten banned a couple times, they came back on characters a couple times. Uh, they kind of ping-ponged around through coalitions and alliances, but they were also seen as a disruptive, fun force in the game, which kind of endeared them to a lot of people that preferred EVE in a more chaotic state. One of those alliances was Pandemic Horde. So when Circle of Two was facing eviction, Pandemic Horde said, hey, come over our way. We'll give you some space down here in the drone lands where we have you know, tons of influence, and you can come crash here for a little bit. Circle of Two obliged. Guardians of the Galaxy, who had been moving uh, Circle of Two out of their area quite intentionally, was like, hey, we're trying to get these guys out of here. What are you doing inviting them into your space? That's not cool. I thought we were friends. That prompted a brief war between these two groups. That war did not last that long, but it was significant in that it happened at all. Uh, this past year also saw a massive offensive from the south, Goonswarm and Test, pushing up into the north and really tested the, uh, no pun intended, tested the relationship between Guardians of the Galaxy and Panfan 
Eventually, a peace treaty of sorts was reached, a ceasefire between the various groups, and terms were given to Pandemic Horde that were different than the other groups involved. Pandemic Horde decided not to accept these terms, which prompted a second war, as now Darkness couldn't fight the Imperium. They really didn't have any targets at all. They wound up losing this engagement. Kind of took a... The, the ceasefire on what I would consider not great terms. They wound up paying for leniency, basically. Uh, so they weren't really negotiating from a position of strength, widely considered to be a little embarrassing for them given the size and stature of their coalition and PanFam. So for them to have to agree to this ceasefire, which was essentially a surrender without them having to trade any space, they were like, ah, we, we kind of need a win. So they started a fight with Pandemic Horde. It didn't go that well, and it wasn't very long-lived. But it did highlight the fact that there are fractures now between what was a fairly closely aligned set of alliances. Now, they do remain unified against the southern threat, which we'll talk about in a second. However, it's clear that if you know uh, <laughs> these southern alliances are able to make the interests of these two coalitions diverge even slightly such as, hey, we're not going to attack you for six months, but we could attack these other guys, and they'll go like, oh, okay, maybe we'll attack some of those guys too. It does highlight a potential diplomatic opening, which could be exploited in the future. Now, if they played it smart, Guardians of the Galaxy and Panfilm will cooperate with each other because they really do need the help. Down the south, there are some very scary customers. Let's transition down into the south. This area has been relatively stable, uh, unlike the southeast, uh, or I guess that's pretty much just the east, generally speaking. Uh, the far deep south has been relatively stable. The biggest changes have been Legion of Death moving into this area down here. We've got two coalitions that are worth noting here. The one is Legacy. This is uh, Tests, Brave, some of these alliances in here, uh, Tickle also considered part of that alliance. They are massive. Test is a huge alliance. This is a Reddit alliance. They've held this space for a very long time. Uh, they're able to field tremendous numbers, have a pretty decent sized super fleet. They can really project their power anywhere they want down here. Dune Swarm. To the left is the Imperium. We covered in the previous videos how they were relocated forcibly from their space in the north down into the south. And what they've done is concentrate their power down there and have been investing extremely heavily in industry. They have two sets of super fleets, a shield fleet and an armor fleet. What they did in the war which they won up in the north, they had several sorties up there. Some were successful, some weren't. The biggest one was, what they were, did was effectively send one of the fleets up there and kept one of the fleets in the south. Meanwhile, Test kept all of their fleets in the south. And so for a period of time, you had this really tremendous two-front north-south war where you had the southern alliance of Test backed up by Goonswarm's super fleet, well, half of their super fleet, uh, fighting Fraternity and Try and some of these guys in here, pushing them out a little bit. You know, Try, Fraternity, holding their ground more than you would expect, given the odds, but still. And meanwhile, Goonswarm pushing up into here, the Imperium pushing up into here, not taking space necessarily, but destroying structures, causing a lot of grief and damage. Meanwhile, they were able to more or less protect their home front with that second super fleet. For a couple of these fights, particularly some in the south, superfleets were relocated by all parties, Pandemic Legion, and well, mostly Pandemic Legion and NC Dot, as a matter of fact, being able to move their supers down south to support some of the fighting. Goonswarm able to bring their second superfleet down to match. We saw some pretty hellacious and just tremendously large battles over the past year. Uh, too many to list in this video right now, but if you go through some of the uh, podcasts on declarationsofwar.com, look up a few of those fights, uh, look up Imperium fights, look up Legacy fights. 
You'll see us discuss this war in pretty great detail. It happened a couple months ago from the recording of this video, so it would have been mid-2018, mid-2018, or thereabouts. Really interesting stuff. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it's going to be well talked about in the next History of Eve book and that kind of thing. The key elements politically is that Imperial Legacy, as this coalition is known, not only did they win, but they established what is effectively a long-lasting strategic partnership between the two of them. They understand that either by themselves can get pushed by Guardians of the Galaxy and PanFam teaming up, especially if, for instance, the Holy Rental Empire were to get in on that action, so to speak, or Fraternity for that matter. So while Goonswarm and Test are incredibly strong on their own, if these other groups were to band together, which they are inclined to do, especially against Legacy or against the Imperium, then they are vulnerable. So naturally, what do they do? They share a border. They share a common culture. They share a lot of shared history. Well, they're back to being friends. So now you have this Imperial Legacy super coalition of sorts where they're effectively not exactly one and the same, one and the same, but often working together and certainly don't have to worry about aggression between each other. That allows them to focus on their respective objectives. Uh, test, keeping the offensive going, particularly against Pandemic Horde and Goonswarm, pushing for industry. We'll talk about Goonswarm in a second. Right now, I want to talk about the ongoing conflict between Test and Horde. Uh, Test, essentially, after signing that agreement, gave it a little bit of time to let the war between Guardians of the Galaxy and Pandemic Horde pan out, but as soon as they did, Test was like, okay, well, we need some content too. Let's go up in there and get some. They took a little bit of time to recharge their batteries and then came out swinging, uh, sending some forces up into the region of Geminate, which is a NullSec region that is effectively Pandemic Horde's headquarters now. Again, not really looking for space, so much as to inflict damage. Pandemic Horde, to their credit, has been holding firm and actually doing really, really well, particularly the NullSec defense side. They, they've really got it down. In fact, you know, Test being unwilling to deploy their super fleet north means that Pandemic Horde, which of course has their super fleet in their headquarters, enjoys a pretty substantial defender's advantage and has been able to leverage it to win a lot of key fights. So, what to do? Well, Tess took a look at some alternative options and picked a very interesting one. We're going to go back to Dotland here because we're going to go to a place that we didn't really talk about much in the last video, but we're going to talk a little bit about HiSec and touch HiSec geography for a second, particularly the region of the Forge. Now, you look at the Forge and you think, well, that's kind of on the edge of Empire space, if this is all Empire space, kind of a little out of the way. But in fact, it contains the most, by far, highly trafficked market system in the entire game, Jita. The Jita market fuels the engine of EVE Online. It's where you can buy any faction items. It's where you can always know that your moon minerals are going to sell, and then you can buy any moon minerals that you need. It is the trade hub in the game. As we transition to the Forge, you'll see that Jita is well-connected, CCP has over the years made changes so that no autopilot route forces you to go through it to help try to cut down on the population, but the population's big enough that it actually has its own server blade. With that much commerce, that's a lot of money on the table. And some alliances, after the Citadel patch, were like, hey, we want a piece of that pie. Let's put up competing market hubs in these adjacent systems to try to get some of that money. If we can convince people to trade in our station, which is right next to Jita, instead of in the main Jita station, it'll save them money because we're charging them less taxes, and we'll get to keep that tax. That seems pretty fantastic. So, that's what they did. Now, it took a while to kind of shake out, but eventually what was established as one of the main trading hubs in the area was the Pandemic Horde trade hub in Perimeter. They had put down, I want to say, a Fortazar at the time and basically forced out competing marketeers and ensured, not ensured, but assured everyone in the area that, hey, you can put your stuff here. It's safe. 
we're pandemic horde. We're huge. We're strong. We're going to protect it. And sure enough, through all the war decks that they got from other Empire alliances, they did, by far. Test took a look at that and said, oh man, they're sure making a lot of money. They're actually making like a strategic level of money. So what can we do about that? If we're not able to overcome their super capital umbrella in Nullsec, let's try something else. Let's hit them in the wallets. Test, in the past several months, has declared war on Pandemic Horde in ISEC, which is pretty rare for Nullsec alliances to do. And they went after this perimeter trade hub. They took it down and they replaced it with one of their own, this time a high-sec keep star. The lar again, the largest possible structure you can drop. And they put a market module on it and now have tried to replace Pandemic Horde as the main alliance that's receiving the income from Jita competition, essentially. Well, Horde's not taking that lying down. Uh, after a bit of figuring out what to do, the strategy they've opted to do is lay down even more competition, basically drowning Est in competition. They're putting up more and more structures with more and more market hubs in them, forcing Test to continue to try to take them down. And now recently, as, as recently as this past week from recording this video, which is uh, January 30th, 2019, They'd actually attacked the Keepstar itself. It has come under attack quite a few times, actually, in the past couple weeks. Uh, this one, a fairly serious push. So far, Test has been able to defend the final timers, but Pandemic Horde continues to apply pressure. And very interestingly, it's sort of drawn the attention of Goonswarm, who is now starting to get involved in the HiSec War Deck game and has started to hit some of the industrial facilities in HiSec which are quite pimped out, as it turns out. <laughs> there's, uh, there's gold in them kill mails to the tunes of hundreds of billions of isk, a, a fair bit of which drops. However, that is a mere fraction of Goonswarm's total potential. Let's move things down into Delve. So this is the region of Delve. This is Goonswarm HQ. They have solidified their hold on this area over the past couple of years, and in the past year, have increasingly solidified their hold in the neighboring regions. You've got Quirius here. Essentially, all of these alliances are satellite alliances for the Imperium, including the Initiative, which is a core Imperium member alliance. The Initiative itself has greatly expanded its borders in Fountain. Uh, they've kicked out, essentially, their only competition in Fountain. That's another Imperium Alliance down there. They've expanded their resources up here into Cloud Ring, taking some key systems up here, providing a staging point to attack the North at any time they want. Goonswarm itself, aside from the big war that was had earlier this year, which you know went on fairly long, but not nearly as long as it could have been, didn't really radically alter the map, as you might have hoped, because of that peace treaty, which kind of cut things off before they got really, really bad for the Northern Alliances, they've been focusing on industry. A lot of mining. Their work while mining operations are incredibly efficient and widespread. CCP releases economic reports fairly regularly. Every time they do, the mining that occurs in Delve by volume eclipses Every region in the game combined. That is how good Goonswarm has been at organizing their industrial efforts. Now, there are a lot of alliances that are sending people down there to try to disrupt that, whether for strategic reasons or just for fun. Basically going whale hunting, trying to get these mining Rorquals and get them killed, basically. They're really good kill mills to get. Goonswarm, for their part, have established a very effective super capital umbrella, which... Not all the time, but fairly often winds up protecting any work walls that get caught, to the point that sometimes Goonstorm doesn't even bother to warp them off anymore, because it's just not worth it to do in terms of the money they lose. That's again, not perfect. They still lose work walls at a fairly regular pace, but they're making so much money that they can afford to replace it many, many times over, and in fact actively invest in expanding their industrial capacity for even more. And they're investing that in, as far as we can tell, two things. One is a lot of defensive structures in Delve. 
their delve, despite its unique geography of uh, long gates. Again, we talked about this with the drone lands, but you'll notice these super long gates. Uh, very difficult to get to delve in the first place. Your best bet is getting down here to Iridia. However, Iridia itself is difficult to get to from other parts of Empire. In fact, really the only reason you would go there is you were planning to invade Delver Fountain. So it's pretty easy to spot you coming from a strategic sense. You could go in through Quirius, but then you have to fight through all these alliances in here. Uh, you could sneak your way in through Catch, but that's probably a gate. Uh, and if it isn't, it's certainly a really tough beachhead to force your way in through. And Paragon Soul is definitely a good uh, invasion point if you're willing to gate through. But again, they're friendly with Tess, so they don't really have to worry about it from down here. They're really the only invasion points they have to worry about are from up here or through Losec. And they're pretty well defended through Losec. Now there is a slight wrinkle in that defensive theory, which is and this is a dotland map of Delve. Got these NPC stations in here. Anyone can dock at these NPC stations. That's a small cluster of NPC space right in the middle of hot, of uh, player-owned space, Sov space. All this stuff is Goonswarm owned. These are owned by the Blood Raiders, NPC faction. You'll notice these stations have cloning facilities. Some of them have manufacturing facilities. Pretty much anything you would need as an invading force. And sure enough, sometimes you'll get groups that come through Iridia, occasionally come through Quirius, and they will put stuff in 1DH usually or to try to force this. Uh, however, it's kind of what's good for, or sauce for the goose, so to speak, uh, or a double-edged sword, depending on your preferred metaphor. The attackers can put their stuff here, but so could the defenders. So if things were to go poorly for Goonswarm, in whatever unlikely event at this point that were to happen, they could evac all of their stuff to the NPC stations here, and it's essentially protected. It can't be destroyed, it can't be forced out, it can't be blockaded. So unless people plan on putting down a permanent presence, they could immediately roll back and take all their space, or fight a very effective guerrilla campaign to defend it. And that's the tactic that the residents and owners of Delve have been employing over a decade, essentially. Uh, Goonswarm is now the latest holder of Delve, and uh, I would say by far the most industrious in terms of maximizing its potential. The other thing that they've been putting their uh, strength into is their offense. Again, we talked about the size of their super fleet. They literally have two, a shield one and an armor one, that they can uh, operate independently of one another. They have the FCs to do it. They have the fuel logistics to do it. And that gives them a tactical efficiency and tactical flexibility that at least at this point, no other single alliance possesses. You could say that uh, you know, PanFam and GOTG, if they're operating as a super coalition, they could have the independent fleets to be able to do that. But likewise, you could say that uh, the Imperium and Legacy operating as a super coalition have the ability to do that and just a little bit more because they've got that third fleet instead of just two fleets. So hopefully this, uh, this video doesn't date itself and you know they wind up having three or four super fleets and the other guys now have two to three super fleets or whatever. At the time of this recording, uh, Imperium super fleet combined is massive. And that is both defensive and offensive. Defensively, it protects their mining operations and prevents them from being dumped on whenever they go anywhere. Which, again, it'll still happen, but not at a rate that they can't replace. And they can project it offensively, effectively fighting a war on two fronts. One up in the north, as they did this last year, and then sort of having their defensive superfleet in range to support tests in the south, should they need it which occasionally they did. So this sets the stage for 2019. Uh, very interesting stuff. At the moment, the hotspots are down here in the east. You've got a little bit of a hotspot here in Empire that's kind of bleeding into Geminid as well with Test. And then you've got some potential hotspots. Certainly if Tri gets a little bit uh, 
better fortunate winds headed their way and they're able to actually get a stronger beachhead, pick up some victories, you could see some interesting shakeup in the pure blind area. Mercenary Coalition disbanded. Their space is still technically there. I assume at some point NC Dot will replace that with something, but it could also be an opportunity for an attack. You've got potential tensions between GOTG, PanFam, uh, GOTG, Pandemic Horde, Pandemic Horde, and possibly Pandemic Legion and NC Dot. Certainly, Pandemic Horde's been operating a lot more independently. You've got kind of the wild card. Uh, Holy Rental Empire here, skill yourself, and some of the other alliances involved are extremely skilled. They're not really emotionally invested in the space that they've taken because they're wormhole alliances at the end of the day. But they could really pop in and out anywhere and join any conflict they wanted and be fairly independent in that way. You've got Fraternity. Uh, in an interesting spot at the moment, they are triless, so they're having to kind of figure themselves out in a way. Uh, they're a fairly large, fairly successful alliance that doesn't really have a coalition behind them. They have a few Renner alliances in here, but no true partners now that Tri is gone. Uh, they're friendly-ish with Scourge, but you know, I don't think their relationship is honestly that close. Scourge itself relationship with skill yourself that's great if skill yourself is all over the place are they going to be able to rely on that that's a storyline we'll have to keep an eye on going forward you've got how well this imperial legacy coalition is going to work and how long it works both sides seem really happy with each other right now and the chances of a breakup right now look really small and that kind of sets the table for the rest of the strategic decision making for these other alliances we have to figure out, okay, if Goonswarm and Test are on the same page, what do we need to do to try to compete with that? we got to make alliances of our own. we got to make some adjustments of our own. So that is where we are at. It's definitely going to be a very interesting year with some of the balance changes that CCP has made, the new structures they've introduced, uh, some of the new ships they've introduced. We've got the... Uh, the new 9UI black market. Pretty excited about that. We'll see what happens with that. Probably nothing huge, but it's a, you know, it's a bit of emergent gameplay. It's hard to say exactly what that would cause or do, but it's certainly quite a bit of trouble happening in Providence, hopefully in the next couple months to keep things interesting. And uh, I'm sure, given that it's Eve, we're going to see some pretty big wars over the winter and spring. And I, for one, am going to be really excited to hopefully join in. And if not, definitely talk about it on Declarations of War. If you enjoyed this video, sign up to my podcast, declarationsofwar.com. Subscribe on that RSS feed. Click the iTunes button. We're also available on Android. Uh, if you'd like to watch me do some of the small gang PvP combat that's going to be going on in Scalding Pass, Great Wildlands, and Providence, you can tune into my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash alec. And if you like EVE or plan on playing and trying EVE after listening to this video, my alliance and corporation are recruiting. Join the Capitalist Army. Talk to your CEO about joining the Network Alliance. We're trying to really drive some unique content in this game. And if you like my videos, you like my podcast, you like my Twitch channel, you will like flying with me, flying with my corp. So consider it. And... Uh, just a shout out, I've uh, gotten a lot of know, fan mail, but a lot of supportive messages from people saying that I and the videos in this series have gotten them into the game in the first place. They watched Eve Geography and Geopolitics and were like, oh my god, this looks awesome. And they've messaged me like, hey Alec, we never would have tried this game if it wasn't for your videos. So if you are one of those people or you want to be one of those people by clicking the EVE download link, signing up, and giving it a shot, I just want to give you a special thank you. And it's really awesome that I've been able to bring you into this community that has been so rewarding to me over the years. And I hope you enjoy it as well. And with that, I am signing off. See you again soon. This has been Alexei Card, EVE Geography and Geopolitics.